Welcome everyone to uh, the latest installment of our WebGyan series. Uh, so WebGyan is uh, one of COVID GAN uh, initiatives, uh, um, uh, uh, new uh, new uh, new attempt to uh, uh, to bring uh, information about the uh, uh, pandemic, the COVID uh, pandemic, to the reliable scientific information uh, out to the public. And uh, uh, today we have, uh, I think, we are live streaming from our own YouTube channel. Uh, and uh, so, uh, so those of you who are joining on YouTube, uh, uh, I think you can also probably find soon the earlier talks in this series uh, uh, on the channel. Perhaps most of you know about COVID GAN. It's a pan institutional uh, uh, initiative which brought together TIFR and all its centers in Bangalore, Mumbai, Hyderabad, uh, Pune, uh, and uh, uh, and uh, together with IASC, India Biosciences, and a number of other partners. Uh, uh, and the Bangalore Life Science Cluster has been a very uh, important uh, uh, partner in this. And uh, the website is now available in uh, at least 10 different languages, Indian languages. Uh, and uh, there is a lot of uh, growing amount of content in these languages translated from English or original content. Uh, we, uh, uh, we would really like uh, the information out there to get to uh, members of the public as much as possible. So those of you who are here, please uh, share the web page or some of the videos and so on on social media and other uh, other venues. Uh, so um, uh, so any case, uh, thank you. And I am very glad that Sandeep Juneja is uh, the speaker today. And I will ask uh, uh, Professor Mukund Tattai from uh, um, NCBS to introduce him and uh, the topic of the uh, talk today. Thank you, Rajesh. Yes, um, so I want to welcome everybody to uh, uh, this edition of uh, WebGyan. I am uh, going to start with a couple of brief remarks about uh, models, about which you'll hear a lot more from uh, Sandeep. There's been a lot of misunderstanding uh, about what models are, and uh, to some extent, uh, policymakers, the media, and the public um, uh, amongst them, there's been a bit of a backlash because the models haven't uh, quite hit their predictions uh, correctly, not just in India, but around the world. So very quickly, just to point out, uh, models are not oracles. They do not predict the future. What models are, are a series of assumptions. And what Sandeep is going to talk about, a simulator, is a way to derive the consequence of those assumptions. Now, uh, just to pick an analogy, you in school, you would have... Uh, uh, prove the theorem that said that the sum of the angles of a triangle is 180 degrees, right? Over there, there's an assumption that the shape is a triangle. Then you do a series of logical steps. And once you do three or four of those logical steps, you discover that the sum of the angles is 180 degrees. Actually, if you draw a triangle on the surface of the earth, the sum is not 180 degrees. So does that mean the original proof was wrong? No, it doesn't. It means that one of the assumptions was wrong. It was a hidden assumption that the triangle was drawn on a flat surface but the surface of the earth is curved. And so the angles of a triangle on the earth's surface no longer add up to 180 degrees. So this is an example uh, of how it's important to understand the hidden assumptions that go into any model and to realize that a model is just showing you the consequences of those. In this way, uh, a lot of epidemiologists around the world have put in assumptions about what we know about COVID, uh, about its uh, biology, about its spread in communities and tried to derive the consequences of these assumptions. Now, unlike this 180 degree proof for triangles, the logical steps that follow from these assumptions could have billions of little steps. And you can't do them by hand. You have to do them in a computer. What you see in the media are just the final graphs, which are the outputs of these very, very complicated logical deductions. And uh, therefore, it's actually quite important for everybody to understand what's under the hood of those graphs. And I think you couldn't have somebody better than Professor Sandeep Juneja to explain this to you. He's built um, a very important city scale simulator for the city of Mumbai. It contains a huge amount of details about what's important to the city. Just to pick an example, um, the public transportation network of Mumbai is the pulse of Mumbai, right? And so one of the things a policymaker wants to know is how important is public transport uh, to open up and what does it add to the risk of COVID? These kinds of very detailed questions, which you can't just work out in your head. You need to work out by putting down assumptions, working out consequences. 
So with that, uh, I'm going to hand over to Professor Sandeep Juneja just to introduce him. He's a professor at the School of Technology and Computer Science at the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. Um, Sandeep, over to you. Thank you. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, everyone can see this. Uh, can, can you see my slides? Yeah, go ahead. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, yeah, as uh, thank you, Vakund, and thank you. It's a privilege to be speaking at COVID-19. Uh, uh, indeed, this talk is about models and models for COVID-19 spread. And indeed, what we understand and what we don't understand about uh, COVID-19 spread. So let me like, jump, uh, jump into it. Uh, this is uh, you know, on behalf of ISCTFR COVID-19 simulation team. And my fellow partners in crime are listed below. Uh, so from ISC as well as from TFR. I call us partners in crime just to keep the mood of this talk light. Uh, I should mention that many of them are not really my partners. I've seen them. I've never really seen them. We've talked on the phone and some people I have seen, but I don't remember what they look like anymore. It's been that long. Uh, but in any case, uh, so Rajesh Sundeshan is a faculty and he's leading the effort from Indian Institute of Science. Uh, Pralad Harsha, Ramprasad, Sapta Rishi, and Piyush Srivastava are my colleagues at STCS. They are theoreticians and so is Rajesh, so they're into theorem proving. Uh, but they've taken it upon themselves to design this tool. And you can see that you know, it's a great combination to have a theoretician willing to you know, make an applied tool. So you bring in that kind of clarity to the whole process. So you move slowly, but you do the correct thing. So that's, uh, that's what comes out from our tool that we have. Let me go ahead now. Um, so apocalypse now, that's where we are right now. I'll just do a very brief review. So you can see this is the map of the world. Um, you know, the disease started in China and Wuhan. And then pretty much, you know, it's a center for business. So pretty much whoever was traveling to Wuhan and out, amongst them, the disease got carried to, uh, you know, financial centers, uh, business centers of the world, like New York City, London, Paris, and now also uh, Mumbai, and then other cities around that. So it's been growing, as we all know, in Europe, you know, after Wuhan and China, it went to Europe and we saw what it did in Italy. Uh, then in the US, Brazil is very active now and India is also, uh, you know, seeing rising infections. Let me move on now because uh, I think the aim of this talk is to focus on the modeling aspect. But let me just talk a little bit about uh, India just to, you know, bring us up to date. So we have already about 3.6 lakh confirmed cases as of 17th June and 12,000 confirmed fatalities. That's a large number. And we are seeing large outbreaks in the major cities such as Mumbai, New Delhi, Chennai, et cetera. We've had a lockdown in the city and the issue is now how to unlock from the lockdown. So that's what I'll be emphasizing on. Uh, just to put things in perspective. So how severe is COVID-19? So let's compare it to flu. So these are numbers from the US. So if you see influenza numbers in 2018 in the US, so 48 million cases, 0.9 million hospitalized and 80,000 fatalities. COVID-19 till June 17 uh, has had about 2.14 million cases. Uh, just one second. Let me just minimize this. Yeah. So about uh, you know estimated about 18 million cases in the U.S. 4% uh, hospitalized and certainly more deaths than influenza. So it's certainly more fatal than influenza, but really what's also much, much more serious about COVID is how fast the, pand uh, the pandemic grows. So it has exponential growth at a fairly high rate. I'll talk about R of zero later. Uh, but what that means is that in various cities, in various uh, regions, where it grows very fast, you typically run out of medical facilities. Uh, you know, to, uh, and that's crucial to COVID. You know, uh, if you have patients, a small percentage of patients will require in, uh, intensive care units, will require critical care. If you have the healthcare ready, then you come out of this crisis much better. The fatalities are much more controlled. On the other hand, if you start running out of this equipment, then the damage can be uh, far more severe. So that's been the, the, you know, that's been one big issue with, the, with this pandemic and that's where uh, modeling plays a big role. How do we kind of help the policymakers decide, you know, in a manner that what kind of interventions that they're doing, whether you're doing a lockdown, or you're imposing some restrictions, how do you manage them? Uh, you know, what does that mean for the whole city? Now, there will be economic consequences, uh, uh, but you know, uh, so how do you balance the economic consequences with rise of the disease and whether you have a medical infrastructure to actually control the disease? So this 
epidemic uh, you know modeling and simulation tool that we are going to discuss uh, in this talk is really about you know shedding light on uh, when you do various interventions and detailed interventions what is the impact of that on uh, the hospitalizations uh, numbers the beds that you need the medical facilities that you need the critical care the facilities that you need all of that all right so let's move on uh, so you know before we talk about modeling so some words of wisdom are in order so this is from george box who was a prominent uh, one of the late one of the top statisticians of last century so all models are wrong but some are useful so that's important to keep in mind that models can be very useful but they are approximation and one should always be careful that they are approximations let me just highlight some points that i mentioned below that some can be dangerous and in what sense because you know once you model an event and you've got you forecasted the numbers that gives a sense of complacency that you know we understand the phenomena that we understand what's going to everything is under control and that may not be true at all you know there are known unknowns that we've not modeled well so one needs to understand that in a model you know what are the assumptions that are going on how solid they are what's wrong with them so these are known unknowns but there are also unknown unknowns you know new things can happen which are completely unexpected so one needs to be mindful of all of this so you play with the models but with a great deal of skepticism around them and i guess the other thing worth highlighting is that you know and this we saw for example in the financial crisis the other big crisis the world faced uh, about 12 years ago in 2008 where where people who were playing with models also had their own agenda you know they wanted models to give certain kind of answers because if you do business deals if you are able to sell uh, housing kind of loan contracts in large numbers then your bonus goes up so you use mathematical models which uh, help you push your agenda and you don't worry about the overall risk you're building in the system so that's always true with mathematical modeling that people always can choose between different mathematical models so you know all of us who are looking at the results of models need to be uh, need to be careful about careful about all of these biases okay so let's move on so what's the outline of the talk um, as mukund mentioned that we know something about covid but really there's some things we know and there's many things we don't know so while we talk about modeling we need to be very clear about what we know and what we don't know so i'll talk briefly just kind of you know bringing up to date my own knowledge on these things uh, then we'll talk about some epidemiological models so sir scir scir plus plus so we'll talk about these models we'll critique them and then we'll come down to agent based models that's the main focus of this uh, talk today what do they mean I'll then go down and talk about details about the model that we've been involved in, the ICTFR agent-based city simulator, and then we'll apply this model to the city of Mumbai, and I'll talk about some of the results that we see. And as Mukul mentioned, that there are very interesting challenges to modeling Mumbai. You know, the transportation network is the heart of the city, the local train network. How do we model that? Uh, containment zones have been there's been a massive activity in Mumbai to try and contain the disease. How do we model that? And what is the impact of all of these efforts? so that's the kind of stuff that i'll be throwing light on okay so let me just talk uh, quickly about what we know and what we don't know about covid-19 as per my understanding so we know it's similar to sars coronavirus that showed up in china in 2002 2003 there's a overwhelming evidence that it spread comes from animals to humans infectious uh, it is very infectious so r0 now r0 basically means that you know suppose i'm infected and everybody around me is not infected because if some people around me have been infected or have recovered then they will not get affected as infected as much so let's just assume that every around me is in unaffected uninfected then you know how many will i infect during the period that i am infected so what's the average number so that's between 2 and 3 for uh, for uh, uh, for covid uh, for coronavirus and that's a fairly high number and we understand that transmission is primarily through respiratory droplets so somebody coughing somebody sneezing that's the primary mode of uh, uh, transmission and it enters through eyes nose and mouth and it mostly affects the respiratory system so these are things that all of us know what we don't know so let's also go through that quickly uh, so there's only circumstantial evidence of reduced virulence in the summer there's no is you know a scientific study that nails it completely uh, but it's it may well be true to some extent and we don't quite know understand the extent some circumstantial evidence of fomite transmission that is if somebody is infected and they touch a door knob or some other surface and somebody who's uninfected again touches them they might catch in the virus and if they touch it uh, touch their face for example 
the virus may actually go into their system. So in transmission may happen. So there's some evidence of that. Now, the third one is everyone susceptible. That's something that we don't really understand at all. It could well be that many people are immune for some reason. And that's something that is not very well understood so far. That has large consequences for policy making. Is there asymptomatic transmission? So people who have the, you know, who have been infected, but they're asymptomatic, can they transmit? Recent evidence seems to suggest that that is indeed the case, that they can. And that's again, very important because, you know, those transmissions are very difficult to control. So to understand that uh, again, becomes crucial. And you'll see from a modeling assumption that we deal with it, but you know, this is something that we don't really understand very well. What fraction of inf uh, infections are asymptomatic? Uh, that is, they never develop symptoms. Now, studies from a variety of settings tell you that this number ranges from 5% to 80%. These are the people who tested positive. So again, this number is crucial. Uh, you know, in our modeling efforts, we see that uh, this is a primary determinant of some of the numbers that we see. So what, what to choose here? So that becomes an issue. Are people who recovered immune to it, at least in the short term? So this is a big question. And you know, it's further complicated now because there's some research which suggests that if indeed you had the infection, but it was mild, then you're more likely to have it uh, the next time. So you know, you're hoping that, okay, I've had this infection, it was mild, that's fine, I've recovered now. The, the news is the verdict is still uh, not out. So you have to continue to worry and uh, take all the precautions. All right, now let's talk about epidemiological models. So I'll talk about SIR models first. So these are approximate simple models. They model the reality approximately, but the fit is exact in the sense that there are so few parameters that you can estimate those parameters quite well. Uh, so that's, um, and it's, these are extremely elegant uh, models, simply stated and with a lot of power to kind of explain things. And it's for that reason we call them SIR models. Of course, I'm being facetious here. Uh, they have not been knighted by the queen. SIR simply stands for susceptible, infectious, and uh, removed or recovered models. Now, what we will be focusing on are more exact models in the sense that efforts are made to model human behavior at a much more detailed level. But then that also means that you have a lot of parameters that you need to fit for which data is simply not available. So you can only approximately fit them. So these are agent-based simulation models. So I'll talk about that as we go along. So first, let's just talk about SIR models. So these are approximate models, uh, which are more or less exactly determined. So what do I mean by this? So this was an effort that goes back to 1920s. So think of a large number of N individuals uh, they're either susceptible, that means they've not had the disease, or they've had the disease and they're infectious, that's I, or they are removed. Removed can be because they've recovered or then they've, uh, or that they've deceased. So they are not in the system anymore. So that's how we classify the population. Now, this is a time varying population. So let S of T, you know, the number of each uh, individuals which are susceptible at time T, I of T is infectious and R of T is uh, removed. By the way, this is the only equation I'm going to have. Well, the ne next slide, but that's, uh, so if you're, uh, if you've not seen very much maths, uh, you're not going to see too much more than this. The so initial number of infections is crucial. You know, how is the infection series? That's I of zero, uh, all right? So now what happens is in this model, what we're going to assume, and let me just go to the next slide. So it's a very nice kind of way to get started. And it's also a very nice introduction to mathematical modeling just to illustrate the fact that, you know, you want to keep things simple, as much simple as possible, and yet capture something of a sense of the reality that you're trying to capture. So how do we do this here? We are going to assume that a susceptible individual typically meets in this large universe of N people, it meets some alpha other individuals in a day. So think of this as saying, maybe, okay, I meet 20 people in a day on average. Uh, and each equal, and here I'm going to make an assumption that this is a homogeneous, nice world. This makes my maths much, much simpler. So I'll assume that any person that I, of these 20 that I meet is equally likely. So each one has an equal chance of running into me. So that's alpha upon n. Now disease spreads when a susceptible individual has an effective contact with an infectious one. So when an infection person meets me, that's the time a disease can spread. And we'll go, we are going to assume that that happens with probability p, say 1% probability or 2% probability, something like that. Uh, I mean, you know, this is where modeling comes in. In reality, it depends upon whether a person is, comes near me, he's infected, not wearing a mask, coughs into me. 
So all of that is just kind of averaged out and we assume, give a probability number to it. So that's how one kind of approaches uh, the modeling effort. Now, what will turn out in this, uh, in this, uh, you know, in this uh, analysis is that what's important for us is alpha times p. So for those of you who understand this kind of method, uh, you know, mathematics, what we are really saying when we say that the probability is alpha upon n, we're saying if you look at a tiny interval of length delta t, then the chance of running into some, uh, somebody in that tiny interval delta t is alpha upon n into delta t. And what's the chance if that person happens to be infectious that I get infected, that's just going to be p times alpha upon n into delta t. And that tells you that, okay, what's really important for this analysis is the product alpha times p, and we'll, that gives a, gets the name beta. So now we have this nice probabilistic model. All these people are meeting each other, you know, susceptible person meets infectious person or other people. Some of them are infectious with some probability they get infected and these balls, so to speak, keep on moving around. And we assume that uh, a person gets removed if a person is infected after, uh, you know, with rate mu. So that means in time delta t, with probability mu times delta t, they're going to leave the system. So that's a very simple model. So you can now imagine that the population is going to play around with each other. If there are lots of susceptible people, lots of infectious people, there'd be a lot of interactions between them, which lead to susceptibles converting into infectious. And that's how the, the game is going to evolve. Uh, all right, uh, this new for COVID, you know, the, it turns out to be, you know, on an average, one stays about six days. That's the kind of assumption one makes for what the mu looks like. So it's one by six. The rate becomes inverse of the how long you stay. All right, now this is a, a probabilistic model. Things are happening randomly. But then you say to yourself, okay, is there a structure in this randomness? So what probabilists often try to do is, you know, to get, tease out some information from a system. You, for example, look at the system and it's large enough. So what happens when the number of population N is large? Now it turns out when N is large, you begin to, you know, if you see the picture of how infectious, you know, how susceptible are converting to infectious and converting to uh, the removed, that picture becomes more and more deterministic. It becomes very clear. There's no randomness in it, any, in it anymore. And that's actually captured by these uh, uh, differential equations so DST by DT just says how much are susceptibles changing at any unit of time, any small interval of time. And that's going to be proportional to beta, which is this contact rate that we spoke about. It's a measure of how frequently people are meeting and how effective is each meeting. Times I of T, how many infectious people are there, times S of T, how many susceptible people are there. So this is the rate at which susceptible pool is being drained out. And that drainage is coming into the infective pool and that's given in the second equation. So DIT by DT, and it's gaining these people. And that pool also is being drained out because people who are infected are actually recovering. So that's being drained out a bit, mu times I of T. And all of that drainage is going into the pool of recovery. Uh, that's DRT by DT. So this is all the maths I'm gonna talk about in this talk. The reason I said that this was a nice model was because you, know, you just have what? Beta and mu, just two parameters one needs to estimate. If you know I of zero, initial number of infected people that you start with, only two numbers you need to find. And that's very easy to find from the data that's available. So a lot of people that you see are using this model, which is a fairly, you know, from a reality point of view, it's not a great model. There's a lot of homogeneity being assumed, which is not true in the, in the world that we live in. But if you assume this model, it's easy to estimate it accurately. Now, if you look at the graph on the right, that tells you what this model is really doing. What it's saying is now, in this, the blue line are the susceptible people. So susceptible people are quickly coming, uh, are diminishing very fast, right? They are becoming infected very fast. So, you know, infections are rising very fast, particularly in the initial stage. Uh, so that happens. And then, uh, you know, uh, after a while, the infected people start to recover. So what you see is, uh, you know, this red line is basically the number of uh, infected people at any time. So that rises in the beginning and then it comes down because everybody who got the infection ultimately recovers or is removed. And then this green line is measuring the people who are recovered or removed. So what's nice about this very simple model is that you get to see exponential growth early on. You know, it captures this a sense of uh, how the disease spreads. And it also, you know, as you see the green curve, it, you know, the, the red curve, it's going down basically. So infections are going down ultimately, indicating that eventually you do reach herd immunity. Eventually, if, if I'm an infected person and everybody around me is not infected, I have nobody I can infect. The infection dies down. So it captures these aspects very nicely. But you say, okay, you know, that's fine, but this model is so of the reality. So what do I do? 
So what people try to do is they try to improve the model by building in more features into it. So what kind of features? You realize that, okay, people don't just become infected when they are uh, come to come in touch with the infectious person. They first get exposed to the disease. It takes some time for the exposure to result into infection. And then once you're infected, you may again be removed. So you have one more compartment. It's susceptible and exposed and infected and recovered. Uh, now, let me just show you this, you know, this uh, chart that you see on the bottom of the slide that's uh, showing the disease progression as we model it. It's kind of a well-established uh, number that people use to use, uh, who, make, who do modeling. And let me give you a flavor of what's being said here. So typically, suppose you get exposed at a particular time, you remain exposed on average about four and a half days. And after that, you become infectious. So this four and a half is an average number. It could be smaller, it could be larger, could go on all the way up to two weeks. Now, once you become infectious, it could be that you know, you're know uh, you asymptomatic and infectious. So you're infectious for a little while, say maybe half a day on average. Or you're pre-symptomatic, so you, you don't show symptoms, you're infectious, and then maybe half a day later you show symptoms. So we have modeled that one third of the population is actually asymptomatic. So after showing symptoms uh, for half a day on average, they recover, you know, completely recover. Two thirds actually show symptoms, and then they can, after some time, depending upon their age or their comorbidity, they have some chance of becoming hospitalized, or they, or a large number of them actually end up recovering. And if you're hospitalized on an average for eight days, there's some chance that you recover and there's some chance that you actually need critical care. And if uh, you are in critical care, there's a fair chance that you may not make it and then there's an even chance that you will recover. So that's typical disease progression model that we use. And this is kind of based on the data that's coming out of Wuhan and also from UK, but this is data that's in short supply. So for example, for India, we don't have this data to the kind of accuracy that we need and we'd like to have. Uh, the conclusions depend upon these things. So that's why it's important to get these things right. But coming back to this compartmentalized models. So now you say, okay, I have more compartments. Let me make it even richer. So this is actually, uh, you know, done by uh, our colleague Shekhar Pujari and others. This is inside SIM uh, state level epidemiological model for India. And what you see here is that you have susceptible people who with some rate become exposed. Now, if you're exposed, with some probability, you become infectious and you're asymptomatic, or you become infectious and you're uh, pre-symptomatic. And now if you're infectious and pre-symptomatic, then with some probability, you become infectious and symptomatic. With some probability, you have mild symptoms, uh, so on and so forth. You get hospitalized and uh, you, may, you may not make it. So, you know, this is more compartments making. So it's an effort to bring in more reality into the model. Uh, the more reality you build in the model, you know, then you have to worry about a lot more parameters to estimate. Uh, the computation itself becomes much more complicated. So uh, depending upon the kind of judgment you want to, you know, you, the decision you want to make, you have to decide as to what kind of model is most useful for you. But again, always remember all models are wrong and all models have their drawbacks and one should always be aware of their pitfalls. All right, now coming back to these kinds of models, so could we be missing something important if we were to apply such a model to Mumbai? So let's look at Mumbai right now. You know, in Mumbai, we have 12.4 million residents. Now, this picture is telling you where they stay. So now I stay in TIFR on the southernmost tip, which is this nice yellow, less populated. I mean, if you had to ask me, I was coming from Delhi. In no way does this uh, southern tip, Kulaba, look like it's less populated. But all I'm saying is that uh, the rest of Mumbai is far more crowded. And uh, you can see that it's well distributed. There are pockets of you know, a huge amount of density in Mumbai. So that's a big deal, by the way. It's generally believed and very reasonable that in more dense area, the disease spreads more. So one needs to capture that well. Now, where do these people, where do people work? And that you can see that indeed, a lot of people, although they live all over, they end up coming to South Mumbai to the southernmost tip. So that you know, uh, attracts a lot of people. So that's a lot of commute that's happening. And then in the middle, that's, uh, that's Bandarkulla complex. Uh, so there's a lot of commute that happens in Mumbai, as we know. You know, it's about 7.5 million people uh, uh, commute uh, every day. They take train every day in normal times. So that's a large number of people. And one needs to model all that to really start to draw conclusions about Mumbai, which are meaningful, which help policymakers make decisions. Now you see this Mumbai. So that's the other facade of Mumbai that 
52% of Mumbai roughly is living in slums. So highly dense area, it's difficult to isolate people. They have, uh, you know, common uh, toilet facilities often, common water facilities. So a lot of mixing, which is unavoidable. And then the remaining 50% uh, lives in non-slums. So this suggests that, you know, perhaps assuming homogeneous interaction, which seems like an elegant model, uh, is probably not a reasonable thing to do. And you need to come up with a more detailed model. So that's our motivation for looking for a more exact model, so to speak, for the reality. So like I said, there's a trade-off, but this seems like the right thing to do for a city like Mumbai. So now let me talk a little bit about agent-based simulation models. Uh, so we'll have a compartment for each individual. So it's that level of detail. But it's a more detailed and exact model. Of course, exact is a, is a, is a marketing pitch here. You know, it's, it's just a more exact model than SIR, which is approximately determined in the sense that more parameters you need to estimate, more difficult that becomes because that kind of data is not available. All right, so what is agent-based modeling and simulation? So just big picture. So this has taken off in the last uh, I guess, uh, three, four decades. So basically you have many interacting agents. These are small, you know, large number of small agents that themselves follow simple rules. Now, if you're modeling human beings, then these agents could be learning, they could learn as they go, and they could be strategic. So their interactions could be governed by some long-term goals. Now, the way to think about these things is that we'll have these agents interact with each other, they'll make decisions, and then the outcomes will be random, which is how things happen in life. So you don't really know, sometimes this happens, sometimes good things happen, sometimes bad things happen. And that randomness is captured using Monte Carlo simulation. So most of you know what Monte Carlo simulation is, and I'll just have a tiny discussion about that in the next slide. So Monte Carlo simulation just allows us now to run the system. You know, people, agents are there, they interact with each other, they see the world as it evolves, then they change the decision, and we get to see how this overall, uh, you know, system of agents evolves. So this complex and interesting emergent behavior. So essentially in agent-based modeling, you're looking to see that from simple uh, interactions between agents, large number of agents, you see a bigger picture, complex uh, 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 behavior coming out. So that's what we want to study. All right, let's a bit talk a bit about Monte Carlo simulation. So that's essentially using computers to generate randomness. Uh, so most of you may know the idea of Monte Carlo simulation goes back to Stanley, Stanislaw Ulam. He's a mathematician and physicist. This was in a Manhattan project when he was working along with John von Neumann. Um, Apparently, he was ill-disposed and resting, recuperating in a, in a, uh, in a hospital, uh, well, maybe at home, and he was uh, playing solitaire with cards. And it occurred to him, as it would occur to many of us, that when you see, when you're looking for a particular configuration of cards, and you ask yourself, what's the chance that I see this configuration? That, you know, while you can do mathematical ca computation, you know, you know that each configuration, each card is equally likely, you can build upon that kind of analysis. What you can also do is that just, you know, shuffle the card and see that combi that many cards lots of times and count the fraction of times that you see the particular configuration you're interested in. So this is just, you know, generating data on your own. You're gen generating these cards randomly from this deck of cards on your own. And then you're doing statistics on it. You're counting the fraction of times you see a successful uh, combination. So this is an idea which is not that great to come up with. But what was nice about what Stanislaw Ulam saw at that time was that he saw that computers can do this shuffling for you. So suddenly the com computers can generate uh, data by billions very quickly. And this was something he, went, uh, he mentioned to John von Neumann in Monte Carlo simulation was born. So one can take many lessons from this story. It's a nice story. One is that, of course, you know, the ideas that uh, shape uh, humanity, the, the big ideas, are you know, often coming from people who are doing deep fundamental research in mathematics and physics, like people like Ulam and John von Neumann. That's a good lesson. Other lesson is, okay, you know, I, there's, a time, there's a right time for any idea. So once you had computers coming up, the time for Monte Carlo simulation had come. So it, it was the right time for the right idea. Third lesson, which I take from this is, and which is appropriate for our times, is all our best ideas come when we are lying around in the bed. I tell that to my wife all the time. I highly recommend it, especially in these days. So anyway, let's move on. Uh, so now we are going to create this agent-based simulation model for the Mumbai city. So what does that mean? That means we'll have 12.4 million agents. So each person is going to be represented in a computer model of the city. Uh, in that city, we'll have you know, each agent uh, belonging to a particular home. Uh, 
we'll have home distributions as we know that Mumbai has. So to match the aggregate distribution at the Mumbai city level, as well as at a lower ward level, we'll match uh, you know, where people go to work, how large the work sizes are, the travel distances, the, you know, the, the children and, uh, going to schools, that will also be modeled. Uh, the community behavior, how do people engage and interact with each other within the neighborhood and within the larger community. So all of that will be modeled. In, for Mumbai particularly, we model how people travel and use trains, how the slums and non-slums are distributed. Uh, so you know, in our model, you'll have 52% of population living in slums. You'll also have people living in non-slums. You'll have this big high-rise, 27-story uh, with very few people surrounded by many slums. So you know, you'll have lots of detail can be built in. All right, so let's go on. Uh, so what is this agent-based sim city simulator for us? So we'll, as I mentioned, generate a synthetic city. So demographics, employment, geospatial data for each ward, all of that will be matching age, household size, uh, school size distributions, urgent, urgent destination matrices for commute patterns, details of public transport usage. So once we have this as a model, we'll simulate it now. That means, you know, we'll start this city with some infection. You know, these are people who uh, flew into Mumbai, say in mid-February. So we'll start the city with some number of infection distributed nicely in the city. Uh, these people are going to engage with the susceptible people in the city. And probabilistically, every engagement is going to lead to uh, some chance of infection uh, passing from one person to the other. Now, probabilistic uh, you know, modeling is done through Monte Carlo simulation. So basically, a coin is flipped, which indicates whether infection happened or did not happen. Once it happens, then we'll model the disease progression for the person who gets infected. So disease progression would be as per the chart which I showed you. And we'll have age-based transition probabilities of people going from one state to the other. And the idea in all of this is that we built in direction, uh, the dynamics to mimic the interactions that we see in the, in the common spaces, like in homes, in workplaces, in schools, and so on. So uh, just to be concrete, so modeling dynamics is as follows. We'll have an, initially a synthetic city that is created with 12.4 million people. The city is uh, seated with infected people at a well-chosen time, uh, sometime in mid-February. At each time step, now we're going to move the city uh, on the computer in small time steps, let's say six hours each. We'll see how many susceptible people there are in the, uh, in the city at the beginning of the time step, who all they engage with, and then who all they transfer their disease to. And then we have, you know, and then people who have just been infected, they will follow their own disease progression, and in particular, they will infect other people as they go along. So for example, you could have somebody who's susceptible, he goes to work, he's maybe not wearing a mask at that time, somebody at work sneezes, uh, who's infected and infects this person. This person doesn't realize it for four or five days. Close to fourth, fifth day, the person starts becoming infectious, there are no symptoms. Maybe his children get the exposure from him. Few days later, the children are playing around, uh, let's say after play, playing around, they are chatting with their own uh, friends. And at that time, you know, they're talking out loud so the bacteria, the virus is going from the infected person to the others. Somebody else gets infected. Then that child goes to his home and the infection uh, continues. So that's, you know, all of that is in this level of detail is modeled by our simulation tool. All right. And then at the end of all of this, you know, we're going to run this simulation for four months or six months. And we are going to count what happened, how many people got infected, uh, 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 you know, uh, how many hospitals were needed how many people need critical care, all of the details will be collected and we'll have these numbers and this will be probabilistic. You know, it depends upon how the system evolves, how the context resulted. So we we'll do this over and over again. In our simulation, we do this 10 times and then we do statistics on the data that we get to ultimately draw conclusions. All right, so now the question for us is, you know, I've told you something which I've just briefly described, 12.4 million people on a computer. It's a massive effort to get this to run fast. So, you know, uh, I mentioned to you that our group has some brilliant theorists. Uh, they're also very good coders. Uh, so we've been able to make this code work so that the output comes out in about 15 minutes on a, on a, a high performing computing system that we have in TFR. Um, and that's probably amongst the, uh, the, the fastest, I mean, it's difficult to compare right now, but it sounds like it's one of the better, faster learning models in the, in the world right now. Uh, but, you know, why go through all this complication? Are you really making better decisions? So that's really a question to ask. Uh, so this is a, there's a quote from John von Neumann that with four parameters, so you know the point of this is that I have so many parameters that I need to figure out. So with four parameters, I can fit an elephant and with five, I can make them wiggle his trunk. I can make him wiggle his trunk. 
So, you know, <laughs> this fitting parameter business is always going to be tricky and difficult. So one needs to be careful when you go for a model which has too many parameters. So pros of this are, uh, you, uh, you know, you can study targeted uh, in interventions. So for example, lockdowns, case isolation, home quarantine, wearing masks, containment zones, partial and cyclic attendance strategies. So all of these different things that, you know, one may think of as a policy maker, we can study them with reasonable amount of accuracy. You know, we do a fairly good job of, accurate, of uh, estimating these parameters and the conclusions while not enormously accurate, do give you directionally guidance as to, you know, what to expect when you do different uh, interventions. And then what's good about our model is now you might say, okay, you know, we've constructed this model, these parameters were difficult to estimate. So there's a big modeling uncertainty. So can we really rely on the numbers? Ballpark, okay, you say, if you've done a good job, the in numbers can be off by 10, 20%. You know, that's just very, very ballpark if, it's, if you've done a really good job. But what's good is that all the errors you made you assume that along different interventions, the directions are all in the same direction. So you can compare them better. So comparison is more meaningful, it's more reliable. And that's a faith that's reasonable to have in mathematical modeling that, you know, in, for these kind of models, that at least for comparison, you will do a better job. I use the word faith, not to say that faith is needed, but to emphasize the fact that wherever you use the word faith, it should be questioned, including in the mathematical modeling. All right, so details about our agent-based uh, city simulator for Mumbai. So it's inspired by the Imperial College uh, agent-based uh, simulator, but with many new features which speed up the computation, as I mentioned, as well as which are tailored to the Indian cities. So modeling of trains, containment zones, all of that. All right, so this is just Mumbai aggregate data. So, you know, we captured this data from the census and try to build a synthetic city which matches all of this. So let me move on. This I've been talking to you about disease progression. So, uh, you know, we our model tries to capture, uh, uh, you know, uses this disease progression data, which essentially comes from a study done in Wuhan and and kind of validated from many other places. So these numbers are maybe off, but not too much. For Mumbai, you know, saying that somebody stays hospitalized for eight days and critical for care for eight days seems a bit less. The numbers look like they should be larger for Mumbai, but that data we don't have uh, to the level of you know. Uh, comfort that we can plug that in our model yet. So we're still looking to improve estimates for Mumbai here. All right, uh, let's move on. Uh, so in this, you know, what we have is in our model is this age-based transition uh, between states. So you can see here that for people who are between the age 30 and 39, there's a 3.2% 3 per, 3 chance that a symptomatic person will be hospitalized. And if the person is hospitalized, then there's a 5% chance that the hospitalized person will actually need critical care. And if indeed the person does need critical care, there's a 50% chance that the person will not make it. So these are kind of numbers that we are using, which come from this study that I mentioned to you. Uh, and the net result of all of this is that the funnel that we get, as you see on the right side, that if you assume that, uh, you know, if you look at exposed persons, so 100 stand, stands for a person who's 100% exposed, 60.6% 0.6% chance that the person will become symptomatic, half the chance that, so 33.3% .3 chance they will have severe symptoms, about 4% chance that the person will need hospitalization, about half a percent chance that the person will be in critical care, and 0.2% chance, roughly, that the person will not make it. Now, these numbers are a bit different from Mumbai than they are for, say, New York, where the, the 0.2 would be larger, and that's because the age distribution in Mumbai is younger. So people in Mumbai are younger than people in New York or uh, in parts of Italy. But you could say that, okay, maybe they have more co comorbidities or maybe there's some amount of malnutrition so people are in poorer health. So that might raise this number from the number that we see here. And that's, those, are, those are valid things, but right now we lack uh, clinical data from India to make a, a better estimate of these things. But I mean, just to point out that you need to use these numbers to draw conclusions in a model. And in that sense, we are, uh, you know, uh, exposed to uh, mistakes that can happen. All right, so there are a lot of other heterogeneities that one can build into the models. So let me go quickly through this because I'm running out of time. Uh, so spread depends on whether the agent goes to work, school, or take public transport. So different spread rates in different places, uh, slums and non-slums have different spread rates, so on and so forth. So there's a lot of heterogeneity one can build in. Uh, let me talk about some interventions that we model. So no intervention is business as usual. 
you know, where there's no restrictions at all, but this is how things were in March or February in, in, in India. Lockdown says things like, okay, they are compliant households and they're non-compliant households. Household rates are going to double infection rates uh, under a lockdown because you're meeting your people in the household much more often. Workplace interactions will come down, uh, you know, we restrict them to be about 25%, 25% because there'll be some people who still have to go to work to do essential services. Now you say, how do we come up with the number 25%? We can give some justification, but there are a lot of these decisions that need to be made, uh, which can't be fully justified from the data available. So community interactions reduced by 75%. So you, you, know, you stop engaging with people that much. Uh, so on and so forth. Case isolation. So if a compliant symptomatic individual, um, you know, uh, if uh, they have symptoms, then they, are, they stay at home for seven days and they reduce non-household contacts by 75%. Home quarantines, these are people who are uh, in the same home as uh, somebody who's discovered to have a positive case, then they're quarantined for two weeks. Schools and colleges close, social distancing of the elderly. So these are kind of uh, interventions that you know, have been uh, imposed uh, worldwide, and these are things that we are trying to model to our code. Uh, so other detailed interventions, you know, combining various intervention primitives for different durations. So for some durations, something, uh, a particular uh, intervention will be active and then lockdown, for example, will be unlocked, more relaxed decisions will come in. Variable compliance across households. So more dense areas, it's difficult to have the same kind of compliance that you have in a less dense area, especially if you're sharing, for example, toilets or water facilities and so on. Attendance profiles can vary, planes can be on or off, you know, just to model uh, different possibilities. People wearing masks and how masks affect transmissions, all of that can be modeled. So what's to see is that you know, a great deal of reality can be built into these models. So that indeed the outputs are quite realistic. On the other hand, you have to make judgment about a lot of these parameters, which makes numbers uh, you know, difficult to be enormously reliable. Let me now talk about containment zones, how we model it. Uh, so this is adaptive modeling. So the containment policy currently is that buildings where positive cases are found are sealed off. Movements in and out of containment zones are heavily monitored. What we did as a first pass was, we said, let's have soft kind of containments. So localized ward level lockdown, depending on fraction of ward population that is currently hospitalized. So what does that mean? So let's look at this uh, yellow curve here. So if a ward has zero percentage hospitalized cases, we say there's no containment effort. And now as the percentage of hospitalized cases increases, so I'm talking about the X axis right now. So for example, it becomes 0.05%, then you see that containment has increased. You know, it's the movement that people had, the leakage that people had has gone down from one to something which is linearly coming down. And then we say, okay, in this case, in the yellow line case, we say that when you have 0.1% of the ward is hospitalized, you know, that's like the worst case scenario for the ward. In terms of uh, policymakers, they've re, uh, put all, in, all of their resources in place and they can't contain movement any further. And th in that case, we're saying 50% of movement of everybody has been curtailed from the usual movements they would have had otherwise. So that's how we model containment. And the idea there was that containment zones are so well distributed in each ward that this seems like a reasonable proxy that, you know, if you indeed imagine that there's so much of hospitalization that's happened, 0.1% corresponds to a, uh, you know, a very large, uh, you know, very kind of a strong scenario for our ward. Uh, with that kind of scenario, you do expect to see a massive containment effort. But we can play around with these things. That's another advantage of these Monte Carlo models that you can play around and evaluate different scenarios. So what if containment leakage was 0.25 or was it, what if it was 10% in the worst case when you employed all the resources? So severity of containment can be modeled at different levels and you can see the impact of that. So I'll talk more about that later. Modeling transmission in trains. So that's a big challenge for us. Now, you know, as I mentioned, the infection really came to Mumbai in around February, maybe January, and maybe in March. And this was primarily, you know, coming from people who are coming from Wuhan or from infected people from Europe or from Middle East. But basically, a lot of people just happen to be in the plane where somebody else is infected. And there's a lot of germs going around because nobody's wearing any um, you know, a mask or you know, watching personal hygiene that much in, in that setting. Uh, so that's where the infections really came in. Now, it's reasonable to say that uh, you know, we are going to fit our model to data from uh, mid-March, uh, basically around March, uh, around that time, because that's the time when people were still moving freely. So you know, that, that had some good properties, which I'll talk about later. But it's reasonable to say that infection was not traveling much in trains at that time, because people who had the infection and people around them were not people who used trains that much. 
So we had to come up with our own rationale for how to model trends. Uh, and what we do, for example, is, you know, so these are just some numbers, 7.5 million passenger trips on a normal working day, 90% of working population is estimated to use trains. Uh, so what we do is, and the logic we say that, okay, in a home, between two people, effective contacts are of the order of 10 a day, let's say, on average. Now, we know because we understand homes and how infection spreads in homes much, much better. From that, we can see, okay, what does it mean for each contact, you know, in terms of uh, disease spread? And now you say, okay, for homes, I think it's 10. For trains, maybe it's 60 in an hour. Or maybe it's slightly more than 60 in an hour. You know, you come up with some number like this. And that's how you back calculate, okay, what must be the infection rate going on in trains. So that's how we do these calculations. And we come up with reasonable numbers for the trains. I should add that, you know, we're not quite comfortable advertising these numbers too much. They give us ballpark idea. And you can certainly play around then, you know, if the 60 was 120, what would that mean? But realistically, our suggestion for Mumbai is going to be, and this, you know, I think it's just common sense, that, you know, trains are the lifeline of Mumbai. So they have to start at a low capacity. You know, you can't have in one meter, uh, for example, 10 people squeezed in. In one meter, in one square meter, you need one person at most so that they're social distancing, right? So that's one tenth of the kind of capacity that you have right now. And maybe you, st you stagger people so, okay, you have one tenth of people, but staggered, so you accommodate about 15, 20% of people. So that's the number that one is looking at to start Mumbai on trains. Uh, but that also means is that you start work also at that, work activity also at that level, at least from people who have to use trains. You really can't jump up and have a big jump of people coming on uh, to work who need trains, because then you have enormous crowding and then we don't really know. If people are not maintaining one meter social distance, uh, you know, the infection can be massive and it's, it's better to avoid that completely. Let's see how the data looks like as you start slowly, understand it better, and then see how much more one can open. But there's no, it's, it's not easy to visualize scenarios where one can jump to bigger uh, occupancy of trains in, in the very near future. One will have to start slowly and carefully. All right, so calibration details, let me just talk, you know, big thing about all of these models, you know, why we develop some faith in these numbers is when we make all these assumptions, that at the end of it, the key parameters we adjust them so that they match the observed data. So what we do for Mumbai is we say that the deaths that we saw, for example, in the beginning of April, for India as well as from Mumbai, but that's when the deaths started to happen. These, these deaths were happening from people who were infected before the lockdown. Lockdown happened on March 25. So these happened before the lockdown. And these happened from few people. So you know, before the lockdown, people are unrestricted. There are no restrictions on them. And they're well separated. So it's not that like the interactions are playing a role. So it's a, it's a clean situation. So we, mod, we choose our parameters to match the, the debts that we see. And debts is the number that we kind of understand and trust somewhat. So we choose our parameters to match that. Uh, you know, uh, that's how we basically solve that problem with the fact that we also put some additional constraints like, okay, roughly equal transmission probabilities of disease from home, workplace and community. This is something that has been seen in other countries. So we kind of use that also as a criteria to come up with some of the key parameters. Um, so now city compliance level, you know, so what should be the compliance level? So I mentioned that compliant people, compliant households behave in some way, non-compliance behave in another ways. So what is this compliance number? So we have some Google mobility data, which tells us how people are moving around. That gives us some idea. Uh, as we mentioned that, okay, uh, in the high dense area, it's difficult to be compliant for very understandable reasons. You are living in a crowded area, you share toilet facilities, water facilities, uh, groceries. So compliance will be low there. So that's how we come up with these numbers. But these are some of the parameters we set to match the observed data. Now, once we do this, uh, we do a pretty good job. Our code is available publicly. So I'll, you know, maybe you should see this slide later, running out of time here. Uh, let me say specifically about Mumbai now. So what we do for Mumbai is, uh, you know, we consider, uh, this was a study we had done around mid-May. So we consider the case that during the lockdown, 60% of people are compliant in some areas, 40% in high density areas. Containment zones have a leakage of 25%, so 25% movement is allowed and under extreme amount of containment. Face masks are modeled. So if you are wearing a face mask that reduces infection by 20%, if two people are, who are engaging with each other, both are wearing a face mask that reduces infection by 36%. Uh, trains may be on or maybe off. Uh, and then we have, you know, this in May 18 to May 31st, 5% of offices are 
operating uh, to capacity, 5% of capacity. This increases to 20% in one scenario in June, 33% in July, 50% in August. And uh, in the more extreme scenario, you have 33% office capacity in June, where then you need trains to be open, and 50% in July and 67% in August. So these are some cases that we can that we study to see what will what does our simulator say about the disease spread. So this is the key graph that comes out from our uh, simulator. So you can see from March 1st, hospitalizations, uh, these are in various scenarios. Now, you know, dark blue line on the top is the more extreme scenario where you have 67 people, 7% 7 of people showing up for work in August and the trains are on. So there you see higher numbers and uh, the, the other scenarios are, you know, for example, the dashed red scenarios when the, your trains are off and you have 20% people showing up in May and 50% in August onwards. So you can see some, some spread in hospitalization numbers, but essentially you see in all of these cases, initially the hospitalization is rising. Now what happens with that is as the hospitalizations in ward rise, containment effort kicks in. So we have our, our core has a flexibility to capture these things and containment slows down the hospitalization. So you see this kind of curve bending a little bit, but then again, infection can pick up and you see this wiggly behavior that's basically a trade-off between containment efforts and infection. But big picture, what you see here, and I think that's a reasonable thing to take back from this talk, that around mid-June uh, to, uh, say, July, you begin to see numbers of hospitalization stabilizing. So what that means is that if, by and large, people are following social distancing, um, uh, if containment effort is on, if masks are being worn, then the number of people that are coming into hospitalization is matching the number of people going out of the hospitalization. So in terms of capacity, if you have 6,000 beds for severely uh, you know, uh, sick people who need hospitalization. As per the model, that's a reasonable number. I would, uh, you know, uh, uh, just to uh, account for modeling error, bump it up to say maybe eight, 9,000 is the right number. With that kind of beds in after July, you're comfortable that you can kind of handle the capacity, uh, the, the load that's coming in. Uh, similarly for ICUs, uh, you see the same thing, but a little shifted because people who are hospitalized going to critical care, critical care somewhat later, but you see a similar trend here. So you need maybe around 1,500 or a little bit more of that to manage the, the incoming uh, load of people, uh, June onwards. All of this is assuming that people behave, uh, you know, observe the social distancing norm as they have been, they don't, there's no change of behavior and the trains are, you know, functioning at a low level and workplaces are functioning at a low level. If they increase, then the numbers may change, they change somewhat. All right, so let me move on. I guess I'm running out of time. So this is a fatality graph. And what you see is that we have a pretty good match uh, going up to last few days of June, uh, till June 15th. And that jump you see is because now we are seeing new numbers coming from the government that apparently they were up till now counting only the deaths which were due to COVID, but not deaths for people with COVID. So for, for a person who had comorbidities and COVID, if that person died, that was not being counted as COVID death. And that's why, that's why the numbers were underreported. So the new numbers are going to come out hopefully soon, and we'll have to do our model now to new numbers because up till now we are fitting our model to the death numbers as were provided by the government. But what you see is that we had an excellent match. So this is just a you know deaths per day. So the the red bars are what you actually see, and the blue bars are our predictions of the model. So they're matching quite well until the last few days. But as we as I mentioned, the last few days can be explained because now they're trying to. You know, put back the backlog of all the deaths that did not come. So that backlog has to be re-spread to be more realistic, you know, put the person to, to uh, you know, uh, in the right bucket when they actually die. And then our model will presumably do a better job of fitting uh, these numbers as well. All right, so the big picture is, uh, uh, okay, so this is uh, for, uh, so, yeah. So I guess the big picture in all of this is that one does expect to see things kind of stabilizing by mid-June and July. If, if the behavior of people doesn't change very much. I mean, all of this modeling is, you know, how do you model human behavior well? So that's always tricky, there will be errors, but assuming that, uh, you know, people are following all these social restrictions and there's no change in, major change in policy, you do expect things to stabilize. All right, let me now, I guess um, I'm probably uh, overshooting my time, so let me ignore all this. This was just to show that if you didn't have containment efforts, then the numbers would be much, much larger than they are right now. So, you know, you these efforts do play a major role in containing the effort, containing the spread of infection. 
uh, the known unknowns in our model. So, you know, right. So the drawback of uh, agent based models is that there are a lot of parameters that need to be estimated, but really you need to focus on parameters that are important. So if you could model the sensitivity of our model outputs to underlying parameters and pick out the ones which are important and focus on getting them right, you got most of the model right. So for example, you know, I, we did a quick simulation. The symptomatic, asymptomatic is probability is 10 times more important compared to uh, uh, the compliant probability. You need to that, get that number. If you make an error on that number 0.1, that's that much more impactful in the number of deaths you see vis-a-vis -vis the compliance probability. So, you know, these kind of conclusions one needs to make. So this is something that's ongoing. Uh, so we are working to incorporate these things, incorporating comorbidities, uh, comparing outcomes of different test testing strategies, uh, et cetera. You know, so, so I mean, I guess for any uh, policymaker, the question is what kind of testing strategies to employ? Should we test only the ones which are cases which are positive or should we test people at random? So, you know, there's a cost involved to these things. So can our model give guidance as to what is the best way to uh, control the overall growth in infections? These are the things that we are working on currently. All right, uh, let me, I guess now, maybe just uh, uh, end with this and I can take some questions. The summary, uh, you can just see the slide, but uh, you, know, you can see the slide and let me open the stage for discussions. Thank you. Great, uh, thank you, um, Sandeep, that was, um... I very much appreciate uh, your introduction to the overall uh, uh, machinery of epidemiological modeling. And then people got a real flavor for what's going on inside your, uh, your own simulator. Um, so, so I think this gives an impression to people about how, you know, how much of a struggle it is to incorporate the correct level of detail and to make all these trade-offs and choices um, in terms of producing something useful for policymakers. There's a few questions. Um, so um, I'm going to, in the interest of time, just ask people to put their questions into the Q&A box and then I'll consolidate and ask uh, uh, Sandeep. So uh, one question uh, from, from Basu, our colleague Basu, uh, is uh, uh, does it matter how you initialize or seed the infection? So 100 in Colaba versus 10 in 10 different places? Yeah, I think I think that would matter a great deal. So number itself makes a big difference, whether it's 100 or whether it's 200. That is, I guess, kind of obvious. But if people are, fo are close together then you know, uh, I guess that would need to much more people uh, getting infected in the in the vicinity and the propagation happening more. So I guess one has to be careful about that. Okay. Um, and uh, Aman has a series of questions which I think I'll summarize as saying, you know, how uh, the lessons from other uh, diseases spreading. He brought up the examples of HIV, TB, smallpox. The idea that it takes a long time to eradicate. Uh, how does that compare to what we're looking at with COVID nineteen? Uh, so that I should say that uh, I'm probably not the right person to say much about this. I've not really studied how uh, other diseases spread. I mentioned about influenza, where the, uh, the disease was spreading at a lower rate. So that's less alarming. You know, you have the medical facilities which are ready, so you can handle uh, disease which spreads at a lower rate. Uh, uh, you know, other diseases like SARS uh, had a much more severe kind of uh, uh, effect on people but the, the spread rate was much, much smaller. So again, the, that was much less worrisome. I'm not qualified to say much more on this, unfortunately. My focus has much more been on modeling. My colleagues, by the way, may be able to say something in case somebody wants to step in. I yeah. don't know if they are able to speak. To I, uh, I can um, uh, give them some permission to speak. Uh, if anybody wants to step in, just put, uh, uh, put in a note in the Q&A. Um, there's a question about schools, which I think a lot of people are thinking about uh, a lot. You know, mm -hmm. uh, it's affecting a whole, uh, a, uh, all students of all ages, they're going to miss a year perhaps, or maybe just online classes. What uh, can you say about advice for reopening schools? Uh, so we are, so that's one of the things we are doing right now. So we are modeling schools more accurately uh, so that we can see how the infection is going to spread there. Uh, Right now, I mean, it seems to me that, uh, you know, uh, one will have to, just like with trains, if you do it, you know, it's probably good for schools to continue to happen online to the extent possible. And uh, if you do start having students coming to school, you want to avoid too much of crowding. That's a big issue. So maybe students coming a few days a week in the staggered uh, schedules. So a class doesn't have people very close to each other. 
uh, that could be something to consider, but that's only in the cases where online teaching is difficult. You know, for some reason, people cannot really study from homes. Uh, other than that, I think I would go slow on these things and just watch how the infection actually spreads in schools. Uh, uh, you know, try, try at a, some level for a month, see how the infection spreads and then decide whether we want to scale up or not. Okay. Um, there's one question about the simulator itself. Uh, is it open source, downloadable? Can other people play with it? Uh, that's, absolutely correct. that's absolutely correct. Uh, so let me just show the slide where I have this. Uh, sorry. Yeah. So code is publicly available. Uh, uh, it's at this uh, github.com. You can see. It. Uh, so just go to ISC website on Epidemic Simulator. And I think from there, you should be able to get a link to download the code. So there's a city generator in Python. And then there's an actual simulator itself in C++. If you have any difficulty, just contact us. We should be able to provide the code to you. Okay, that's uh, that's great. So I think it's a great benefit that many other people can use the same underlying engine to test out their own ideas about how things might uh, might work. Uh, there's one question, uh, an important one, about contact tracing. So as you know, the authorities um, in states throughout India uh, have been tracing the contacts of known infected individuals and uh, quarantining and, if necessary, testing them. Uh, that level of contact tracing intervention, as opposed to a lockdown style intervention, is that mm -hmm. in your model? So we are very. So we've actually incorporated the, you know, the basic coding infrastructure in our model. What we've done is as follows. So a person has cells around that person, you know, about hundred meter cells. So there are there's a neighboring community of that sort, and then there's a community of people that the, the person is regularly interacting with. So when a person gets infected, we know roughly the people that the person engages with. So amongst them, we find out the ones which are, uh, you know, then we do some kind of testing to see. Uh, if you can trace out and identify the people who are actually infected and we can isolate them. So our code will be able to actually do this and then, you know, this uh, test out which strategy works better because there's a trade off in these things, you know, too much of contact tracing, isolating too many people also means that you're losing some kind of economic activity. On the other hand, uh, you are preventing in infections from spreading. So the answer is yes, our code is pretty much there. This is something, you know, we should have out in a matter of uh, days and weeks. Great. Uh, and in the interest of time now, I'm going to take a couple of questions and consolidate them as the last question to you, Sandeep. Uh, and these are, I think, very important ones. Uh, one question is, you know, the model is being fit to data that is being put out by the authorities. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a question of how complete, comprehensive, or reliable these numbers are. And on the other end, the outcome of the model, uh, how do you display the uncertainties, either in the data availability or indeed in the randomness of the simulation? Right, right, right. Uh, so yeah, I mean, so the first question, okay, data does, so we try to take uh, public sources. So all data is taken from census. Uh, for some conclusions, you know, you have to be broadly right. You don't have to get that 12.4 million down to 12.7 million. So in that sense, one can afford to be a little bit wrong. Uh, but nonetheless, for as you saw from my discussion, the death numbers, fatality numbers are very crucial for us because we trust those numbers. You know, our model relies on being able to predict them well. And it actually, I didn't emphasize it enough, but it does a very, you know, we fit our uh, data to uh, uh, observe patterns increase in deaths in April, but thereafter it predicts pretty well what happens in April, May, uh, June, some parts of June, etc. So that's that's very nice. No, but now we realize that the data itself was wrong for the deaths, so we will have to adjust those kind of things. So that error, we, you know, those are kind of unknown unknowns that we just have to kind of adjust to when we see them. Now, in terms of the error. We do do 10 simulation runs, so we get an idea of statistical error of our estimates. That's about just plus minus 3%. It's not very much. If you see the pictures in my graphs, uh, I should have a small shadow. Sorry. Yeah, so the shadow that you see around each, in each line, that's showing the statistical error. So that's not going to be very much. Uh, what's a bigger source of error is the modeling error. You know, when we say that asymptomatic probability is one by three, is that really correct? Because it could be a number from 5% to 80%. So that we are not showing. One drawback of our kind of model, which takes, you know, 15, 20 minutes to run a single run, and you have to run maybe 10, 15 runs to get an idea of what's going on, is that you can't play around with all kinds of numbers too much. So I can't say, okay, let me play around with asymptomatic probability being 80%, and then being this, combined with all possible variations which can happen, 
and see what the things, uh, what, what the answers look like to get a good feel for what the error of the model really is. Uh, so yeah, so modeling error is difficult. One way we plan to capture this, as I mentioned, was through sensitivity analysis. So we get a good idea of, of what our model is really sensitive to. And then there we get an idea, okay, maybe it's sensitive to this probability number. This probability number actually may lie in this bar, realistically speaking. So let's see what that means for our model. So it's an ongoing effort, but modeling effort, uh, modeling uncertainty is, is, uh, is uh, never easy to quantify. One just has to live with that and get a sense of what it is from different uh, playing around with different parameters. Great. Thank you uh, very much, Sandeep. Uh, um, and thank you for the COVID Gyan, Web Gyan team for putting together such a smooth session. Thank you for all the attendees. A uh, lot of questions and answers. Sorry, we weren't able to answer them all. I think there is some mechanism by which you can um, send in questions later. Um, and uh, there might be some way to get the answers out in some consolidated way. So I'm going to um, uh, say thanks again to everybody. And that will be the end of the session. And